Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Shibli Talami, who is the Anwar Sadat Professor for Peace and Development at the University of Maryland and a fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. He is the author, most recently, of The Stakes, America and the Middle East, uh, published by Westview Press uh, just the, earlier this year. Shibley, welcome back to Berkeley. Pleasure to be back here. So what are U.S. interests in the Middle East? You know, when you look at it at this stage uh, and you say, you know, what could be so compelling about America's interests that America may be prepared to war, it's hard to really know that there are interests that would drive a country to war on a scale that we are preparing. But there are important interests in the Middle East that remain. One is oil. Yes, oil is still important. A lot of people have uh, assumed that uh, oil has diminished, Middle Eastern oil has diminished in value because of the proliferation of other producers. Uh, other people think that we can wean ourselves from importing Middle Eastern oil. The reality of it is that there's only a single seamless market. It really doesn't matter where you buy or sell oil. It's just one market. And the Middle East will play even a bigger role in that market in the future. Today it accounts for two-thirds of the proven oil reserves. It only accounts for 25% of the oil supply. It's a simple arithmetic. Mm -hmm. uh, as time goes on, in fact, within a decade, uh, most likely all new oil into the market is going to come from the release. It's still about oil, in part. So that's clearly an interest. And, 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 and w let me just clarify this. And what, what we're talking about is, for example, with the rise of China, China is going to need Middle Eastern oil. So, so even people who aren't, at, who are only at the table in a limited way will be there. Undoubtedly, China, in fact, imports today 60% of its oil from the Middle East. It's likely to be importing up to 90% of its oil from the Middle East. As you know, the dependence on oil is increasing because of the incredible growth that they're experiencing, particularly in certain sectors of the economy. Cars, for one thing. And you, this year, Volkswagen is going to sell more cars in China than it is selling in the United States of America. It gives you, an, you know, sort of a picture of what is happening in China. And obviously, China is trying to invest in, in, in the Gulf. Now, all of this doesn't mean that you need to have military presence. Historically, in fact, the trend has been very clear. Mm -hmm. uh, it is really a demand and supply problem. Market takes care of itself. The oil producers are going to sell. Uh, they need the income. They can't help it. And they're going to buy the best products available on the market, regardless of the political calculations. In fact, even during the Cold War, Middle Eastern states traded in oil in, uh, along a pattern that was completely independent from the political coalitions and alliances that they built. So why would you need military presence in that strategy. I'm not sure that you do, but I think in the American calculation historically, there has been one factor that has influenced the American strategy dating back to 1949. And that is that the U.S. feared not only cutting off of Middle Eastern oil to the West, mm -hmm. but it sought to deny that oil from powerful enemies. The logic was that it wasn't just the fear of not getting the oil at reasonable prices, but it was the fear that if you have a powerful enemy controlling so much of the world oil, that would be even more powerful, and in that sense, it would be more threatening. And, and that strategy began by Truman in relation to the Soviet Union. Truman put a policy in place that was called a denial policy, and that policy stipulated for blowing up the Arabian oil fields mm -hmm. if a Soviet invasion were imminent. Uh, the logic being not to empower the Soviets further by controlling them. And they went to the extent of considering the use of radiological weapons in the oil fields mm -hmm. to accomplish the task. In fact, the CIA in a 1950 study uh, that was recently declassified uh, talked about the options and ruled out uh, the, the radiological weapons option in part because it wasn't very good as a conservation mes measure. It would have denied the Soviets the use of, 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 of the oil, but also would have made it harder for the West to control them upon reoccupation. And they opted instead for a conventional 
for a conventional strategy to blow up the oil fields uh, if, in fact, the Soviet invasion w were imminent. And Eisenhower, in the late, in the mid 50s, after the Suez Crisis, in fact, broadened that doctrine to include not only threats from the Soviet Union, but from what he considered to be threatening regimes in the Middle East after the upheavals in the region after the Suez Crisis. So the U.S. has had a, a strategy all along uh, that was predicated on the assumption that you cannot allow powerful and unfriendly states to control so much of the world's oil because it will empower them and make them potentially threatening. Before we get to the other interests, let's, let's go on a little more with oil and, and help us understand why Saudi Arabia is important in this equation. And, it, and, I, and from reading your book, uh, which covers all of this, one gets the sense that it's like going to a gas station and topping off basically. That's what they always can do as in, in the last resort, add more oil. Is that? Well, it, 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 that's important. I mean, if you look, first of all, at their own reserves, they, they alone account for more than 25 percent of the proven oil reserves globally. You can imagine, therefore, how important they are in, in, in the marketplace. But more than that, they have a, a huge production capacity, bigger than anyone else, and they have a leeway uh, to make up the slack in the market, uh, to make up shortages in the market, for example, if Iraqi oil were to come off uh, line for, for some reason, uh, and they can withhold. And moreover, their oil is very cheap to produce. It might cost some, somewhere between 2 to $3 a barrel. Mm -hmm. In fact, if the Saudis were wanted to behave irresponsibly, uh, from the point of view of the international market. They could drive a lot of people out of business by underselling for a long period of time and then, and then charging higher prices. So they have the capacity. They have actually played a moderating role, both because of the political relationship. In fact, that's been the price of that political relationship. What the U.S. has gotten from the Saudis largely is this moderating role on the oil market, although the Saudis in part has played that game for their own interest. They, they certainly had a, other calculations in, in maintaining uh, the low price. Think, for example, for a minute. Um, if in war with Iraq, you have the Iraqi government blowing up its oil fields or the oil fields being blown up accidentally and being uh, out of the market for something like a year, more than they were out of market in Kuwait, which is about six months. Think about what would happen in terms of the economic shock, the, the high oil prices, and who is going to moderate that? Uh, who is going to, uh, well, really only the Saudis can play the role of, pick, and, and that's why they remain very, very important, and I think one can imagine scenarios in a war with Iraq where they will be even more important. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we've talked a little about oil. We'll come back to oil in a minute. What, what is our second interest in the region? Israel. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I say this, you know, without hesitation, and I think it's certainly a factor in the calculation of everyone in the background. Uh, the U.S. is committed to Israel. The body politic in America is committed to Israel. What does that mean? It means a couple of things. One is if Israel needs help, uh, whether it's military, political, or economic help, the U.S. will be there. Uh, if Israel needs uh, a resolution vetoed at the Security Council, the U.S. is prepared to go against 14 members of the Security Council to veto that resolution. That's the price of that support. That's what it means. But the other side of the coin is that if Israel has the upper hand, as is often most of the time the case with the Palestinians, and the Arabs are on the losing side, America is always blamed for empowering Israel. There's no escaping that dilemma. It's, you, you can't say that America can disengage from the Middle East because simply the US, U.S. is a player in the Middle East because of this feature of the relationship uh, and because of this commitment. So in that sense, uh, when we even think, when you say uh, the Iraq or Iran are potential threats to allies, clearly they're potential threats to Israel more than anyone else in the region. And in that regard, part of the calculation pertains to that. I still don't believe that that has been the issue that has driven the President of the United States, President Bush, in his calculations about Iraq. It has been an issue in the debate 
It has been an issue for many part, uh, many parts of the administration. It has been an issue in the political arena, obviously. That is support for Israel. A support for Israel, mm -hmm. uh, clearly an issue for m many people, an issue f in the body politics of America, an issue in the debate, and an, is an unstated issue always uh, in the debate, or often in the debate. But I don't think that's why the president is going probably to wage war with Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he came with that instinct. And people speak of uh, what we call the neoconservatives as, as really being the ones who have led the administration to this path. I actually don't agree with that entirely. I mm -hmm. think they've been a very, very important force in the tactics and the strategy that has led to the, to the point where war may be it had become in inevitable, mm -hmm. almost inevitable. But, but you're saying, right. it, but it's not because of our support for Israel or, or the, 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 the fact that the Israeli ta uh, tail is wagging in the American dog. What I'm saying is that the president's calculation is not because of that. Okay. I think the president came with that instinct. I think some neoconservatives care a lot about Israel. I see. But now, he came with the instinct to support Israel. He mean, came with the instinct to go to war with Iraq. Uh, to go to war with Iraq. Okay. And, and I think the neoconservatives basically read that instinct mm -hmm. and gave it uh, 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 ideological support, political support, uh, uh, and bolstered it and reinforced it mm -hmm. and, and helped push forward in a momentum that became unstoppable okay. ultimately. But it isn't, the, I don't think the President of the United States decided I got to go to war with Iraq for Israel mm -hmm. or even for that matter for oil. Okay. Before we go on with the, I want to clarify one thing about our interest in, in supporting for Israel and help us understand how the, the, the Arab world. Uh, sees Israel and its existence. Uh, as a result of the breakdown of, of the, the Camp uh, David summit, there, there is an ambiguity in the air about whether uh, the Arab states and whether the, the Muslim peoples of the Arab world are willing to accept the existence of Israel. You know, let's look at it slightly differently. Think about why, what the source of resentment toward the United States in much of the Arab world and probably most of the Muslim world. And some of that resentment is not connected to the Arab-Israel issue. I mean, the U.S. is seen as an anchor of a political system that is not serving the people well. Mm -hmm. And that includes authoritarian regimes and other economic issues as well as foreign policy issues like the Arab-Israeli issue. And there is resentment of the U.S. in every part of the world not just in the Middle East, as all the surveys show, and, and they don't have an Arab-Israeli issue in Latin America mm -hmm. and in Asia, and yet you have a lot of resentment toward the U.S. But in the Middle East specifically, the extra passion in the resentment mm -hmm. is very much related to the Arab-Israeli issue. In part, the Arab-Israeli issue is not just another issue in this game. It is the prism through which the Middle East sees America. Uh, it is an inescapable prism. It is, it's an issue of identity, collective identity. And it shouldn't be surprising. It has nothing to do with Arab governments liking the Palestinians or even serving their interests. We know that governments serve their own interests and often abuse issues. It isn't even about the people themselves willing to, be, to sacrifice individually for a cause. It is that subconsciously, when they look at the world and they look at the America, they look at it through this prism, which has become an identity issue to them, in the same way that Israel has become part and parcel of contemporary Jewish identity. Mm -hmm. And I think if you look at the history of the half century uh, since World War II, uh, you will find that for Egyptians, for Jordanians, for Syrians, they fought wars over this issue. Every single generation was formed with an imprint on the collective psyche that is related to this issue, and usually a humiliating imprint, a defeat. Uh, and so you can understand why every generation since World War II has, in fact, related to this issue in the passionate way that they do. And today, what has happened, particularly since the collapse of the Camp David negotiations, is that they see the bloodshed on daily basis 
and it rubs in that humiliation that they all feel collectively. Mm -hmm. And so America is judged, in a way, through this prism. And when you ask them, when you tell them, uh, when America goes and says, we're going to free the Iraqi people from the tyranny of this ruthless dictator in Baghdad, and they say, why aren't you doing something to free the Palestinian people from the pain that w they, we witness every day? That's what they focus on. And you can imagine, Israelis are focused on their own pain, on the victims of, of suicide bombings. That's what the television in Israel is going to show. Well, Arab television today, which is transnational, is going to focus on the pain of the Arabs and especially the Palestinians. So in that sense, it's truly central. It is inescapable. It is something that I think will continue to define the American relationship with the Middle East, no matter what happens in the Iraq crisis. And, and the movement toward peace to some sort of settlement, just even the movement uh, works against that animosity toward America vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, uh, the Palestine-Israeli conflict? Well, when, when if you, let's put it this way. If you look back at the 1990s, this is a good contrast because you, you have, uh, at the end of the Cold War, people in the Middle East still thought the end of the Cold War wasn't good for the Middle East. They thought this is going to be an era of American hegemony and therefore Israeli hegemony. That was the interpretation in 1989. Iraq invaded Kuwait. The game changed. There were coalitions built and the U.S. found itself in partnership with some Arab countries. And in the 1990s what happened was that the U.S. put forth a a moderate plan, so to speak, of, of a, 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 a regional order that is based on a negotiated settlement of the Arab-Israeli conflict, as well as economic development and political support. And throughout that decade, for the entire decade, in fact, people started buying into it even, even if they didn't like the terms of it, even if it was a messy one, even if people thought this is not a perfect one. They thought it was an inevitable course and that is going to improve the lot. And as a consequence, you found consolidation of relations between uh, many Arab countries in America, in fact, uh, between many Arab countries in Israel. Uh, you found that it, every single year, uh, from the year that uh, the Oslo agreements were concluded in 1993 and the year 2000, the number of terrorist incidents in the Middle East went down according to State Department statistics every single year. And by the year 2000, it was the lowest of any region around the world except for North America. So clearly it's consequential, uh, even if it isn't, you know, but, but it has at some point to bear fruit. What happened in the collapse of the Camp David negotiations in July 2000 is they weren't only a collapse of negotiations, they were collapse of a paradigm. It, they were the collapse of the Pax Americana and the decade of Pax Americana of the 1990s. And in, in, in a way, we're back to square one now. Mm -hmm. And the question is whether there will be a package like that that could restore that relationship. The price that was paid by the failure of that is that people are going to be very reluctant to buy promises anymore. Mm -hmm. In the 1990s, in a way, they bought promises. This time, it's going to be harder to sell promises. Uh, and therefore you need to have more concrete measures more quickly than was achieved in the 1990s. We're covering a lot here, but, but we, uh, the overall design here is, is to lay out our interests. We've talked about oil, we've talked about uh, the Israel-Palestine uh, conflict. What else? Are, what are, is there anything else that we should put on the table as a U.S. interest? Well, in I, I think that it, at the strategic level, those are obviously the interests. Now, I think that every nation has a right to define moral interest of its, of its own. Um, including uh, issues of human rights and democracy. And I think um, that those issues resonate when there is a coincidence of strategic interest. They don't when there is no coincidence of strategic interest. And I think in this particular case, you can make even the further argument uh, that it is no longer possible in this sort of global era as we have seen uh, happen in 9-11 in, in to separate what happens domestically in the region, what happens internationally. Uh, it is, it's much more difficult to separate between the domestic and the international than it used to be. And as a consequence, I think, there is an American interest 
in bringing about political and economic reform in the region. Uh, I think it is an American interest, a global interest, it's certainly a regional uh, interest. But I also believe that this cannot be done coercively, that this cannot be achieved coercively. In a way, you have two fundamentally uh, competing notions. Uh, one notion is that you need this change uh, that must happen on the, in the economic arena, in the political arena, in the region, toward more liberalization. The other notion is that because of the fear of global terrorist threats, and because terrorism is fundamentally a non-state phenomenon, not a state phenomenon, that thrives in instability, that is empowered by instability, um, you also don't want to create too much instability and too much motivation for groups that would come after American interest. So how do you mediate those two problems? That's going to be the trick for American policy, mm -hmm. I think, in the next decade. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so, so we've laid out our uh, concerns, our interests in the region, really, you know, and, and, and taken our long-term view here. Now, then we're confronted with 9-11. You know, this, this act by Osama bin Laden's uh, uh, group, uh, uh, that that shattered our perceptions of what was going on in the world. Uh, how uh, do what what? Uh, how, let's talk now about our political response uh, to those events, and, and then go into how uh, those uh, policies affect the region. You know, and we'll talk about the Iraq War. Uh, was the administration? right about the way that it defined terrorism and the threat it posed to the United States? I think you put your finger on really the biggest problem between the U.S. and much of the world uh, in the way the U.S. defined the terrorist problem and the responses to it. Let me start with an example. Um, a year ago, uh, I hosted Nelson Mandela at the University of Maryland to give this Sadat lecture. He went to the White House that morning, met with President Bush. That was just two months after 9-11. He came back and gave a lecture, 10,000 people, and said he supported America's war on terrorism, including what America was doing against al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. This is Mandela, who is certainly reluctant to support powers and superpowers in acting in the third world, has been in the forefront of that. He said that. Now contrast that with what he has been saying more recently. Mm -hmm. The harshest word you can imagine against the U.S. Well, this actually is also represented in the surveys that have been done right after 9-11, the sympathy that the U.S. got globally, the support that the U.S. got from states, even states like Iran, early on in the war against al-Qaeda, even states like Syria, which provide a lot of intelligence in the war against al-Qaeda and now where you have the pervasive opposition to the way the U.S. is. So what's going on here? What happened? Well, let me tell you, I think, where the, where the differences are. There are, in my judgment, five fundamental differences. One is people's response to the 9-11 was that this was a horrific attack. The U.S. has a right to respond. It's got nothing to do with terrorism as such that this is an attack against America by a horrific group, and the U.S. has every right to respond to that. Uh, because of that. But they didn't want America to define every other group or every other terrorist uh, or group that in engages in terrorism, including those that have not attacked America, including those who are more consequential for other regions, more vital for other regions. And in that sense, there was a, a, a discomfort when the U.S. basically was defining, let's now do this against that group, including those that have not attacked America. And there, there were major disagreements about, about the issue. Second, I think most people around the world think that the issue of terrorism is not simply about supply like the administration thinks. The administration thinks it's really about organizers. Let's smash the organizers, it's over. Most people around the world think that there is a demand side. Mm -hmm. The organizers succeed in part because there is an environment out there that is conducive to recruitment. Why do people join? Why do people 
pay funds? Why do people uh, uh, support in public opinion? And that those conditions have to be addressed in a genuine and effective war on terrorism. And most people around the world wanted to do both at the same time. That's why they saw the solution to the Arab-Israel issue as being critical in addressing the issue in the Middle East, that mm -hmm. you can't avoid it. And third, I think most people disagreed with the notion that terrorism, quote, is another ism of mm -hmm. history, mm -hmm. uh, like totalitarianism and fascism, and as if it's an ideology or political coalition or movement. Most people see it for what it is. It is an immoral means used by different groups for different ends. It doesn't define the group. Terrorism is a description of the means that are used by a variety of, uh, of groups, including states, unfortunately, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and therefore, in order to win that war, in order to reduce the occurrence of terrorism, you need to, de to delegitimize it, particularly in the eyes of those groups and societies that condone it and accept it. And you can't establish legitimacy and illegitimacy by force, and certainly not unilaterally. Certainly not unilaterally. By definition, you cannot do that unilaterally. And a lot of people were upset, particularly when you go and in, 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 in the spring of last year, uh, the U.S. does the right thing in saying to Palestinians, Yes, you've been under occupation for 35 years. You deserve freedom. You deserve an end to occupation, but not through any means. Suicide terrorism, terrorism of any kind is unacceptable. That's mm -hmm. a good moral position to mm -hmm. take. But then we don't turn around and say to Sharon, we understand you have the pain of your people suffering with these attacks, but that doesn't give you the right to use any means, including using human shields or violating human rights on the West Bank and Gaza. And if you don't make that consistent position, then your moral authority is undermined and you cannot delegitimize it. People are not receptive on the other side. That's another reason why there is a conflict. And I think finally, if you look at it from the point of view of the way this issue has been defined in the public discourse, we focused on it as if it's a phenomenon that's peculiar and particular to the Middle East and particularly to Islam as a religion because of the horror that was, you know, uh, that America suffered through in 9-11. But the reality is most people don't accept that uh, because terrorism, we know, is common in every place. And in fact, the Middle East has not been the place where more terrorism has occurred historically, not even suicide terrorism, because as you know, suicide terrorism has taken place more you know, among the Tamil rebels than even among uh, groups within the Middle East itself over the past And decade. they're not Muslim. And they're not they're Muslim, Muslim and they're not uh, Arab and they're not from the Middle East. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the, the point is that it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a phenomenon that's related so much to theology, culture, and history. It's related to politics and need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. All of that, obviously, comes together into a frustrating issue because this is the priority issue for America and mm -hmm. America wants it to be the priority issue for almost all of the other states. Mm -hmm. And think about the final point where of disagreement. I think there was a rapid movement from thinking about Al-Qaeda as a threat into then moving to consider the threat largely to be a state-sponsored mm -hmm. threat. Mm -hmm. uh, and the axis of evil thesis, the focus on Iraq specifically as the next threat, shifted the focus from the real threat of Al-Qaeda, which is that it is the empowerment of non-state actors, especially in the era of globalization. These horrible people who attacked America, there were fewer than two dozen of them. They used nothing but box cutters and technology that was available to all in the era. They didn't need states to do it. Mm -hmm. And even today, think about it, after a year and a half of the sole superpower putting all its resources on the table, where do most of these fighters hide today? In countries that are friendly to the U.S., mm -hmm. like Pakistan and Afghanistan, whose governments are truly helping, trying to help to control the fighters of Al-Qaeda, but they remain there because that's where instability is. Mm -hmm. And the very logic of that threat is very different from the logic of a threat that is posed by states like Iraq or North Korea, 
The U.S. is powerful enough to deter any state in the world, has in historically, and including Stalinist Soviet Union and Maoist Russia, can defeat any state or combination of states today. But it's very different mm -hmm. threat that the world sees out there in Al-Qaeda and the different response that is required. So the world is very frustrated, fundamentally frustrated, with the way we have proceeded to confront that threat. You, you argue in your book that by, uh, 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 on the one hand, we made the mistake of creating this uh, diffuse definition of the enemy, you know, terrorism, and that we failed to focus on what the threat was, which was a means used by different groups, and we, we, we chose not to go down the multilateral route of coming up with a treaty that defined terrorism and, and creating, working on international public opinion to reverse the legitimacy of that. Well, talk I, a little about that and why you think we made that choice. Well, I think there were two reasons. Reasons. Um, one was that it is always convenient to use a label to define your enemies. And in a way, the fear was that the, since terrorism now is sort of the threat, that if you didn't label an enemy a terrorist, then it's not an enemy anymore. We lost the term enmity. I mean, you know, you could, um, the U.S. has a right to define any enemy. It has a right to define Hezbollah as an enemy or mm -hmm. Syria as an enemy. That's, that's a question of interest and, uh, and threats. But it is as if we forgot that you can do that without labeling a country terrorist. So mm -hmm. the, 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 it was the employment of this new label mm -hmm. um, as a way of defining enemies and, and, and mixing the two together. But the second reason, I think, is that the, the fear of multilateralism, of tying one's hands um, mm -hmm. in going after the enemies that one wants to choose unilaterally. And, and I think here, in this administration in particular, given the tendency to want to go unilateral, there was a fear to tie one's hands. I do think that early on, after 9-11, there was a fabulous opportunity for strengthening international treaties that prohibit violence against civilians. At least start with that as, a, as the, as the uh, line for defining terrorism. Deliberate attacks on civilian targets. And I think that even immediately the U.S. got a, a, a uh, unanimous resolution condemning terrorism, but without defining it. And I think had there been a true effort done then when, there, when, the, when the world was mobilized, when the U.S. had the moral authority, when there, were a, when there was a lot of sympathy, I think we could have succeeded. And, and by now, I think it is um, too late uh, in a way to, uh, as, as was witnessed uh, by the attempt of, of uh, Malaysia, Malaysian Prime Minister to, to even get something like that himself uh, among Muslim countries, uh, uh, you know, just in the, in the past year, and, and that has not worked. Uh, you're, you're telling us, and, and you, you argue this in, in your book, that, that uh, by uh, missing this opportunity to deal with terrorism for what it was, we, we, we have chosen another route, and, and you've just suggested that also, and it's almost... Uh, 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 we do states. We don't do transnational groups. Is a is a, a, a bumper stip, sticker way, I guess, of saying that. And but you are not only a student of of uh, the Middle East, but also of international relations. And and what we're witnessing now is uh, the change in a strategic doctrine that that argues for what uh, uh, the administration calls preemption, which maybe better should be called. Uh, uh, prevention, but but whatever it's called, it, it's really an argument about uh, that that purports to tell us why we should do states and not transnational terrorist groups. And and the argument goes something like this: that these these groups, because of their ties uh, with uh, so-called rogue states, will. Uh, 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 that that relationship will uh, position these uh, terrorist groups, and I assume they have bin Laden and mm -hmm. others in mind, to obtain weapons of mass destruction, which uh, would greatly magnify the threat that they posed. Uh, so you're, you're looking at a chemical, a biological weapon being dropped in, in some major city or a nuclear device. What uh, what is uh, wrong with that as an argument for justifying why we do states? Well, let's separate the, 
the two ideas that you have here because there really are two. One is the, the doctrine of preemption and the other is the, the suggestion that states uh, are uh, particularly menacing states or dangerous states or whatever you want to call them uh, are likely to pass on uh, weapons, of, weapons of mass destruction to militant groups that may then carry out attacks against America. Um, if you think today, if you ask any proliferation expert, including within the administration, uh, what is the biggest fear of weapons of mass destruction getting into the hands of a group like Al-Qaeda today? Where are the sources? Where are the likely sources? And you ask them that question. I think the answer would be first the former Soviet Union, second the former Soviet Union, third the former <laughs> Soviet Union, mm -hmm. and then you'll probably go down to uh, Pakistan if its government collapses, if you have anarchy, mm -hmm. because instability is the most likely source of these weapons, not states handing them over. And in fact, if you look at the instances of wh where, where this had happened, you probably had cases of rogue scientists, not rogue states. Mm -hmm. uh, look, think about the anthrax attack here in America that we don't know who's behind it, but most likely what's the theory behind it is. Uh, so first, I don't think that's likely. Second, in the case of states, states, you know who to, whom to punish. Sure, it might be harder to trace, but do they want to take the risk mm -hmm. of being found out? Uh, when, in fact, there is a country that can punish them ten times over. Uh, and when you look at the history of states using non-state militant groups as instruments of policy, Sure, if you look at a militant group like Hezbollah in Lebanon, certainly it's being supported by a state like Syria and Iran. But think about it. That, the fact that it has that relationship with a state, in fact, has been a restraining factor. Mm. Hezbollah, yes, has attacked targets largely in or near its borders and largely against Israeli soldiers. They have not dispatched suicide bombers into Tel Aviv like to kill civilians in Tel Aviv. And had they done so, Israel would have retaliated against Syria, no doubt. There are red lines that are not crossed. So actually states are restraining factors in the case of these groups. In the case of Iraq, the only reason we worry about this kind of contingency is that Iraq remains under very few incentives to move forward because of the sanctions regime and no hope seemingly of getting out of that. And it, it could become a factor, but it's not the same as worrying about the instability. The, the preemption doctrine, which I, I, wanna, I wanna address that separately because I think it's a real important mm -hmm. issue. That worries me a lot and I, I, I take you back to 1991, uh, the first Gulf War. In 1990, in August of 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait. If you look at the public opinion, as I told you earlier, in the Middle East, they thought the, before the attack on Kuwait that this is going to be an era of American hegemony and Israeli hegemony, and they're all trying to scramble to figure out how to address that with, with the demise of the Soviet power. And Iraq invades Kuwait, and very quickly, the U.S. builds an incredible coalition of weak states, medium-sized states, strong states, to fight the war against Iraq. And the winning argument, I was at the, then at the U.S. delegation at the U.N. The winning argument was this. Do you want the norm, the principle, that a powerful state could invade a weaker state <laughs> to become the norm of the post-Cold War era? And do you want to do it and then do it in confrontation with the most powerful state of all, the United States of America. No state wanted to uphold that principle, especially not weak states. That was a frightening prospect. And today, what's that same logic is propelling people against bandwagoning mm -hmm. with America. 
because what they see today is the imp that what they fear is that Iraq is instance one of a preemption strategy mm -hmm. that is to be followed by other cases. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to legitimize it by accepting the notion. So they're applying the break so as not to give it the legitimacy because everybody feels frightened by it. And if I were a, an aspiring and frightened third world country that I might think I might be next, mm -hmm. uh, I would accelerate my weapons of mass destruction program so as to deter the possibility of preemption. And if you look at what North Korea did, uh, they did precisely that. They had every reason to think that they may be next after Iraq, given the rhetoric in Washington and given the doctrine of preemption. And they have exploited the window when the U.S. is engaged in the Iraq issue to make clear that they're going to produce enough to be able to deter an attack. Mm -hmm. I'd expect Iran to do the same thing, and I'd expect the tendency across the international community to be similar. So, so that the very uh, strategy to, to, to prevent something is creating incentives for it to happen, at least to, to acquire nuclear weapons. All right, so let, let's go back now, because you, you started off talking about Iraq and, and why we were doing it. So, so why do we do Iraq? I mean, what, 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 what is, is it, we have a lot on the table here. There, there's something in, 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 in the president that wants this to happen. There there is a, a doctrine out there that that actually they floated in the in the first Bush administration, but which was shot down. That we have to uh, be preeminent in every region and and prevent anybody from aspiring to that. We now have a an argument about a prevention to or a preemption to achieve that. But why Iraq and why now? Again, I go back to the president, and let me tell you why I go back to the president. I go back to the president for the following reason. There's always been a school of thought in Washington that wanted to do Iraq, even before this administration came to power, and certainly within the Republican Party. And certainly many of the people who now are in the Department of Defense and in the White House who advocate the use of force against Iraq uh, have advocated it even before the elections and in the political debates uh, and while the Clinton administration was in power. And the reason for it is, you know, weapons of mass destruction, uh, destruction, uh, dangers to allies, especially Israel, uh, the assertion of American power uh, so that people don't think they can get away with uh, defying America, uh, establishing a, a line of power, exploiting America's superiority in the, in the post-Cold War. Or all of that, certainly uh, an argument. But that argument would not necessarily have won had the president's instinct wasn't in that line. Because I think if you look at what happened after 9-11, 9-11 could have taken America in a completely different direction. It was not, it was, the, the public was fully behind the president. The president had a lot of leeway. The public was fully behind strategic decisions related to addressing Al-Qaeda, and it could have been a completely different decision, which would have said, look, this is a different threat now. Iraq isn't as much of a threat. Let's put it down the line uh, and downplay it and then move in a completely different direction, including possibly Arab-Israeli peacemaking, uh, multilateralism, and perhaps, you know, a focus on Al-Qaeda uh, more specifically. I mean, that, that, and had the president decided to do that, I don't think the neoconservative would have won the day. I think it would have been a debate in America, but the president would have tipped it a different direction. Mm -hmm. So the president has been the tipping uh, 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 variable. And that tipping variable didn't happen because of 9-11. He himself arrived, every person who knew him and met him knows that he was focused on Iraq. I don't want to psychoanalyze why he saw Iraq as a threat, but clearly he bought into that. And 9-11, created an opportunity to do it, to fulfill it. Before 9-11, it would have been difficult to get the American public, the international community. It's difficult now to get the international community. Imagine uh, how difficult it would have been without 9-11. Uh, so 9-11 opened up an opportunity, and the, the neoconservatives and others rallied behind that. Now, why 
do so many people strategically think that it's a good thing still in Washington, aside from the president himself? And I think there I see something, even aside from issues like oil in Israel, uh, I see something about the exercise of American power. Uh, and I see something about a, uh, uh, a, a, a sense uh, that um, America has not exploited its power advantages that came with the end of the Cold War in the way that it should. And uh, that today America can achieve its objectives by a more aggressive employment of that power. And you can see in a way this dramatic shift in mood between 9-11, which was one of the lowest points of vulnerability in America psychologically, and then the morning after the collapse of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan, which happened more quickly and efficiently than most people mm -hmm. believed, that you had this incredible shift in mood from weakness to almost invulnerability that came with this, the sense of power that came with the exercise of the new technology in, in, in the military in, in the war in Afghanistan. And I think that sense of power emboldened this trend. And we're still sailing on the aura of that power. And I see that as extremely dangerous because I do not think that any power, let alone in an era of globalization, can achieve its primary objectives and stay powerful through the strict reliance of brute force. And 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 this uh, this new, very ambitious vision, uh, on the one hand, seems to suggest that building on this power and this psychological high, however you want to characterize it, that we can reshape all the regimes in 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 the region uh, uh, and turn them into a string of democracies. Yes, I, I you know, I, I always wonder um, uh, whether everyone who says that believes it mm -hmm. uh, or whether some people employ it as a tactic, and I don't know. But some people believe it. No mm -hmm. question in my mind that some people believe it. But it seems to fly in the face of history. Mm -hmm. Think about this issue pertaining to the Middle East. There is this notion that if we go to Iraq, topple the government, we can install a democratic regime, and then start changing, putting pressure of emulation at least, if not direct pressure on other governments to follow suit. But the reality of it is, the minute the regime in Iraq is gone, America inherits a broken country. And Iraq becomes a top priority in a way that bears directly on national security, protecting what will probably be 75,000 troops for a number of years. Uh, and the American public want them to be safe, uh, uh, maintaining a unified Iraq uh, at a time when you're making deals with all the countries. Look at the deals made with Turkey, including allowing them to intrude into northern Iraq uh, in conflict with the interests of the Kurds, who are also allies of the U.S., so to speak, in this, in this effort. Uh, uh, you have the oil issue. Um, the U.S. is going to need the help of a lot of producers to uh, put down pressure on the oil prices, particularly after the war. Uh, you have the war on terrorism intensifying, which means that you need to make deals with governments and their security services to provide you information and close uh, financial mm. shops. And in addition to that, think about the lead-up to a war. Think about what sort of thing we're facing. Uh, in a case, in a country like Jordan, which has a monarchy that actually believes that liberalizing a little is going to be in its interest. They actually think that that's helpful to them, both economically and politically. But they're facing a public opinion, like everyone else, that is decisively against American policy and decisively against the war. And the U.S. is asking them, join. We need you. Uh, we need to put troops on Jordanian soil. We need to have special forces. We need to have some Air Force units 
on Jordanian soil. We need your political support. And the Jordanian come and say, well, we have a choice, either responding to our public or responding to you, and they will likely respond to the U.S. And in responding to the U.S., they worry about the public so much that they unleash the security services and they uh, tighten control and they arrest people and they prevent demonstrations and free expression. And in the process, you don't have more democracy, you have less democracy. Think about Pakistan since 9-11. Uh, uh, Musharraf has become an American ally, an important American ally, <laughs> for the task of defeating Al-Qaeda. And the American priority there has not been to bolster democracy. Pakistan today is not more democratic than it was 9-11, in some ways maybe less. Mm -hmm. If you couple that with the American fear, when they look at the results of elections as happen in Pakistan and see that those who are winning are those who are more hostile to America, more friendly uh, to America's enemies, there is that fear which then drives America not to emphasize democracy as a priority. So I am considerably less confident mm -hmm. uh, that America will make it a priority to spread democracy, particularly in an era where you're fighting issues that are going to be more critical for national security, as is likely to be the case. So, so in a way, what it, it comes down to, I think you're saying, is it's about power and how you use that uh, power and, and, and and, uh, and, and your vision of the future. And interestingly enough, in your, in your book, you, you devote a lot of attention to something that's being ignored, which is public opinion in the region. You, you argue that it's been mobilized, that the technology is informing people in, in ways that regimes or the United States doesn't control. Talk a little about that. And so if, if, you, if you suddenly have the situation where we're there and it's about implementing power, uh, which is in a way that's inconsistent which the, with the values that we have, what is this going to do to the Arab public opinion? Well, look, States are still the key players in the Middle East, no doubt. And governments have developed very effective repressive mechanism, and they still have the capacity to control the public discontent, largely. Obviously, there are always exceptions to the rule, and as you know, uh, we political scientists haven't predicted revolutions very well historically, <laughs> so they do happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're rare. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the, the, you know, in history, they're rare anyway. In the Middle East, they've been rare. Uh, so let's start with that. The governments still have the capacity to control, and they probably will, and, and most of them will survive even when they do things that are unpopular. Uh, but they do it through repression. Remember that. That, that. that doesn't lead to democracy. It leads to more repression. But there is a new dynamic that makes it a little bit uncertain for them and complicates their lives in, in ways that they cannot escape. Uh, and that is the new media. Historically, Governments nearly monopolized the media in the Middle East. Never fully monopolized it, but, but largely were the key players in every single country. Uh, there has been the rise of the transnational media in the Middle East. That has been really propelled by the technological revolution, particularly satellites, and the fact that prices dropped and more people have them. And as a consequence, you have a proliferation of stations, including stations that are not directly controlled by governments. And if you are an Egyptian or a Jordanian, uh, and you turn on your, your television set, uh, you have satellite service, you can have something like 50 different stations to choose from. And, and you're not going to necessarily watch your government station if your government station is the most boring, and in some instances they are. They're showing the president or the king shaking hands with uh, hundreds of people. They have to show every single one of them for 15 minutes at the top of the news. And so you have options. And that opened up a different logic for the competitors. So if you're a small station that want to reach the entire Arab world now, you can by virtue of that technology. And you say, how am I going to get them to switch? on my program. So you say, therefore, how do, what does my consumer want? And my consumer changed. If I'm broadcasting out of a little emirate of Qatar or the United Arab Emirates, uh, I no longer say, what does my Qatari consumer want? I now say, what does my Arab consumer want? Because everybody speaks Arabic, whether in Morocco or, or Egypt or Saudi Arabia. And that's a 300 million people market as opposed to 200,000 people market. And so 
your consumer changed. It is now the Arab. That's the prototype that they try to reach. They try to craft the news in a way that resonates with that individual, that consumer that is called the Arab. And therefore, they try to find things that are in common, even if they conflict with the views of particular regions. In fact, in many countries, including Saudi Arabia, most people get their news from sources outside their own government. So governments no longer have the monopoly to control the information because of this phenomenon. And that makes it a little bit more difficult for them in times of crisis. When they want to spin the news, it makes it difficult for them uh, to, to do it. We have been seeing something very interesting in the past a uh, 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 few weeks uh, in the lead up to a possible war with Iraq, particularly in Egypt. And that is that the Egyptian government, uh, having apparently decided that war is inevitable and that they can't stop it and therefore they can't go against it and therefore they're going to try to protect their strategic relationship with the U.S. And yet the public opinion is decidedly opposed to it uh, for a variety of reasons. They've decided to give the media a new spin, which is that uh, now it's all up to Saddam Hussein, sort of shift the burden and say it's up to him with the expectation that if there's a decision that he hasn't, you know, uh, 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 performed, then it'll be okay to, to wage the war. Um, this will be a test. Uh, in Egypt, uh, a lot of people have access to non-Egyptian television, but a lot fewer than in some other countries. Egypt still uh, focuses on its own media more than any other in the Arab world. So if it succeeds, doesn't mean that others will succeed. But if it fails, if this message doesn't hold, and I'm actually conducting public opinion surveys as we speak in Egypt and Morocco and Saudi Arabia, about attitudes, and we'll see how the public is, is actually affected by these um, attempts. If it fails, it tells you that it is probably already outside the control of the governments, this information arena. Shibley, on that note, uh, thank you very much for spending this hour with us and, and giving us a, a breathtaking overview of, of uh, uh, our dilemmas in the Middle East and, and, and uh, really a, a, an informed look at our policy. And, and we heartily recommend your uh, new book, uh, Shibley Talami, The Stakes, America and the Middle East, uh, published by Westview. Thank Thanks. you very much for Thanks being very with much. us. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.